early but well done uh, Chris Barris everybody uh, here for a Captain Meets interview at uh, it's about half past seven in the morning we've had about three hours <laughs> it's, it's not quite that early it just slightly feels like it yeah. but welcome man yeah thank you for coming lovely. in cheers man um, some people may know you you've been um, touring now for well you've been making music for the last four or five years plenty of uh, recognition on you know British rock music stations and stuff like that yeah. but Let's let's talk about growing up on the English Riviera, <laughs> uh, the beautiful Torquay. Yeah. Um, is Torquay or Torbay? Tor well, Torquay's part of Torbay. Torbay is like the whole bay. And there's like right. three main towns. Torquay's the biggest of the three towns. See, this is it's like a travel show as well as a guitar show. So come on, tell us about uh, growing up and how your obsession with the guitar started. Yeah, well, I started playing. I was probably about five years old. Um, my dad was a musician and um, he played in like cover bands and stuff like that and um, so I grew up around like proper music you know and uh, lots of vinyl, lots of uh, Gary Moore, Deep Purple, Great. White Snake, Rainbow and you know all stuff like that. Um, and yeah I used to go and watch his band and that kind of was like my first inspiration and um, so he started off teaching me and <clears throat> kind of got me started. And then I started going with like different local teachers and I just took to it. You know, I used to come home from school and I'd, I'd play and, until I fell asleep with the guitar in my hands, like, you know, and I loved it. I did my first gig of his band when I was nine. Ah, oh, brilliant. Yeah, and uh, I remember I saw Thunder play. <laughs> um, they were like, God, my dad's favorite uh, guitar player, probably overall guy was always Gary Moore, but his favorite band kind of became Thunder. And um, so that kind of like got passed on to me. And they were the first <laughs> band I ever saw. I was like nine, ten years old. And I saw them, I was like, that's what I want to do. And that's crazy. Yeah. So do, when, have you got um, Danny playing your music on his rock show now? On, yeah. That must, that must actually, be kind of surreal. Um, I've taken over Danny's show on Planet Rock. I do for this you? For, well, for five weeks at least. Anyway, yeah, he's moved on to the Sunday slot. And I've, I've been doing my own show. Oh, amazing. Uh, so Barrett DJ show, as Planet well rock. now. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, we're, um, I'm supporting Thunder at Wembley Arena in November, November the 21st. That's, Tickets on sale now. That's when you know, like, you know, childhood heroes and all that kind of stuff, and then you end up supporting them, and I'm sure they'll call you on for an encore at the end. It'll well, be some mind-blowing, yeah. like, tick. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually met met any of the guys. Oh, okay. Um, but I mean, I've seen them tons of times. And Yeah, we, we had them on, uh, must be nearly a year ago now, maybe, I, I, I don't know, but really lovely, lovely guys. Talented, you know, Funny. great songwriters yeah. and, and um, you know, great band. But yeah, it's ma amazing. Probably one of the most successful British rock bands, you know, still going now as well. Yeah. So, okay, so you were, so first gig at nine, um, was that when you really, you know, at, at what age do you think it's fair to say that the option of being a guitar player professionally became, you know, you started to think, okay, maybe this is reality now, not just fantasy? Yeah, well, 
I mean, I was kind of like my late teens. I mean, I got to like 17 and um, I was at sixth form. I, I did well, uh, music GCSE, A level and all that stuff. And I was in, I had like my own local band and uh, we did lots of cover gigs, but it was also writing stuff. And we did a few bits of Bob, so we had like a little, little tiny amount of success. We did some stuff in the States, recorded an album in Philadelphia and we did a couple of tours. Low level stuff, but we had a guy that, Invested in us, a manager that took us on, and, um, and I, you know, I was 17, 18 years old, and I had a lot of people around me telling me I was going to be a rock star, and um, I believed it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, it's quite sad because, well, maybe not, maybe it's why I'm here today, but I, um, you know, I honestly believe when I was, I was touring the States, uh, I kind of took it all for granted, mm -hmm. and then it all fell flat. It all died and didn't go to the next level, and um, I just became like really just fed up, you know. And living where I live, you're so like disconnected from the rest of the mm. country, and I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get my music out there. Obviously, that that wasn't um, you know the modern age. You know, I don't, back then, the YouTube wasn't even a thing. Mm. I don't think. So, what are you talking here? Sort of mid noughties or you know, yeah. bit later? I mean, than I was that, like maybe? seventeen, eighteen, so I, I don't know when that would have been. Uh, yeah, early early two thousands. Right. Yeah, I'm thirty four now, so yeah, right. early early two thousands. Um, when did YouTube start? Yeah, about two thousand. Well, we were on it two thousand nine, two thousand and ten, well, exactly, maybe. So yeah. I don't. I might have been going for a year or two before then. Yeah, but, but I mean, even even when it did, it was still a while before things for really sure. started. Yeah, you know, like MySpace like was where it yeah. all started. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it was really tough, and I just didn't know how to do it. You yeah, know? I just didn't know how I was writing songs and. And looking back, I wasn't good enough. I don't, you know, I don't, vocally I wasn't strong enough. The songs weren't strong enough. And I kind of just left music. Um, right. I was teaching guitar. Um, I was gigging in cover bands, function bands, doing all yep. the usual wedding crap and uh, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> destroying it, my soul. For those, for, the, for those of you that don't know, um, you know, where Chris grew up is in a beautiful part of, of uh, the UK, but it is a bit remote isn't it it's very much yeah. like a it's really known for its sort of tourist summer season and all that kind of stuff and i can understand you know it's like if all the action feels like you know you've got to be in london or something like that you know you, you yeah. you're, you're a good four or five hours drive away aren't you yeah. so not easy yeah. and that was still very much the thing like you know you spoke to anyone it's all like, oh you've got to be in london you've got to be in mm. london you know it's not quite i mean london's still important um but it's not the way it was. You can record an album at home mm. now on your laptop. You can do stuff like that yeah. back then. Like I used to do all my demos on a little Tascam like tape thing, a little yeah. four track thing or whatever. Um, you know, and then I had to find money to try and get into a studio and all, all this stuff. You know, yeah. It was a lot, lot harder. Um, now you can record on your laptop, you can pay 50, 60 quid, yeah. get it distributed to iTunes. Nothing, nothing. But anyway, I, I, I couldn't see like a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing some okay stuff in like the education world. I was teaching at a, a music college, the Academy of uh, Music and Sound. and um, Some bits like that. But I also had uh, another hobby, which mm -hmm. I also did from a very early age, um, which was martial arts. Yes, I read <laughs> this. So. It's got to come up somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us, I mean, you know, so so tell us about the, uh, you know, I mean, I'm kind of fascinated with the, the way uh, MMA has exploded over the last mm. five years or so like that. But yeah, so choice of uh, playing guitar, being punched in the face, was that was that a difficult... Um... Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, you know, I was like eight, 19, 18, 19, the music stuff was really getting me down. I just didn't know what to do. Um, I felt like I was, I was putting in a lot of effort and just like, smashed my head against a brick wall. Um, so I started training again. I had a couple of years off. I started training again and, and it just like, transformed my life. I suddenly started like, sort of getting a lot more healthy. I stopped drinking and, um, you know, and it, and it kind of gave me like a new lease of life. And um, I, never, I never started training with the intention of fighting or anything like that. I started doing quite well and I started loving it and I thought well I'll just have like a couple of amateur bouts. So I did that kind of thing, won those and then I was kind of like well actually I'm quite good at this and then I was, <laughs> I, I got, I was just getting more and more opportunities with the fighting stuff yeah. and then before I know it I was, yeah, I mean I started off in Muay Thai, like Thai boxing and then the whole way made things like started to get big and I thought well, I fancy having a go at this and I remember I started, I remember having a conversation with my dad and he was like oh you're mental, what are you doing, like you know like 
your hands. I was like, I don't care. Like, you know, I was just, I'm loving it. I want to have a go. Um, I was like, I'll never fight. I just want to train MMA. I was like, I'll never get into a cage. Yeah. And then a year later, I had my first uh, semi-professional fight. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I just had more and more opportunities. I had opportunities to go out to Vegas. I spent a lot of time out there training with a lot of top uh, UFC That's guys mad. at Randy Couture's gym. And it doesn't look like you've ever broken your nose. It's been broke twice. Oh, actually, it has been. But Fair enough, been I mean, it went one well. way and then it, I got smashed back the other way. <laughs> I've done all right here. Yeah, my ears didn't go too bad either. <laughs> but um, you know, it was a great part of my life. It was a really, really, you know, I did it for like ten years. Wow. Um, you know, I made some. Fantastic friends, um, had a great time. Also, I, you know, I ended up uh, becoming a part owner in a couple of gyms as well, and I was training other fighters. And and guitar was just always like on a back back seat, you know, because I couldn't ever see myself doing anything with it. And then I decided um, I didn't want to fight anymore. I had a couple of fights out in Asia. I fought in Singapore. I uh, won a stadium title in Thailand. And then I was just like, do you know what? I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve. I can't see myself going any further. I wasn't good enough to make like the UFC, um, not without moving to the States full time to improve. But so I, I, I stopped fighting, but then I had this like hole mm. in my life, you know, I've, I've always been like an active person and I was, just, I was training other people, but I needed like something for myself. I just sat down with the guitar one day and just started writing songs. And it came really natural to me. I found like I had a lot more to say. Um, uh, yeah, I think that time away, that life experience and everything mm. just gave me a whole new approach. And what it also gave me was like, uh, it kept me grounded in a sense of like, realism, and, you know, because I had that thing when I was younger mm. and, you know, I honestly believed I was just going to be a rock star. That was it. I was like, no. I had everyone telling me I was 17, 18 years old. Oh yeah, you're going to be huge. You're amazing. You know? And you, you start believing it. All oh, right. Okay. Mm. You know. Um, and it didn't. And I spent a lot of years, you know, quite bitter about the music industry. And, you know, and in pub gigs, I'd always have, you know, people come, oh, you're amazing. You should do X Factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, oh, you should be doing bigger gigs. Why aren't you doing bigger gigs in this? Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. Shall I just, uh, I'm going to ring Wembley Arena tomorrow, see if they'll uh, book me. But, um, you know, I. Yeah, but I think that time away meant that when I come back to it, I didn't take anything for granted. I don't take any of the stuff I'm doing now for granted. And I see like a lot of younger bands, uh, you know, that I meet on the road and stuff, and you know, they're just starting out and they already think they're rock stars. I'm like, oh, you know, I, guys, you you're not, you won't get anywhere with yeah, that attitude. You know? I must admit, I I worry for, you know, a lot of mental health issues in young people today and stuff. But within the guitar industry, every brand and manager and social media platform is looking for the next talented 12 year old, 13 year old kid to play guitar. And there's all these very talented kids out there that really, you know, they get, they're getting this huge spotlight and attention because they're young and talented. And then as soon as they're 16 or 17 years old and the kind of the novelty of them being young has worn off, the brands just go, well, unless you're, you know, you got any songs? No, okay, fine. Who's the next 12 year old? Yeah. And you've had five years of your life, this terribly, in, you know, where you're so influenced by everything of people going, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing. And then you're just gone. And the next 12 year old kid or whatever it is, is in. And I just wonder how some of these kids are gonna cope with it, you know, cause it's, and you've, I think, you know, your advice of, of just being grounded, man. And, you know, just like, don't, you know, until you've had that, number one single or you yeah. you know you've established yourself just just don't let anybody and i'm, you know. I'm sure you agree you've, you've met plenty of famous people and uh, all the actual rock stars real rock stars mm. that uh, my friends or people i've met they've all been the coolest guys mm. and all the kids that i've met in the industry <laughs> are the people that aren't getting anywhere they're the people that are you know struggling to sell 100 yeah. tickets a show and you know and um, I think that's quite an interesting thing. Mm. You know, the people with the attitude that I've met, they're not getting anywhere. They're doing mm. the same thing for five, I think you've six, got to seven, be, ten years. You've got to be unbelievably talented as a songwriter and a performer to be a kid and still make it. I think, you know, as you say, most of the people who are good players and good songwriters, but not necessarily like, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say names, but you know, like the, the absolute triple A tier stuff. Yep. 
they're all lovely people because if they weren't, people would just go, oh, it's not worth it. You yeah. Know? So, Especially these days as well because there's not as much money in the industry. You mm. know, everyone's got to work harder. Um, you know, particularly on like the live side of things. That's why all these bands are still touring because they're not earning money from record mm. sales anymore. You know, Spotify's not paying. Yeah. Unless you're Ed Sheeran. Yeah. Well, this is true. <laughs> yeah. Good old Ed. Good old Ed. 10 billion streams a year. <laughs> you can still make a living out of that, just about. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, the, the band. So was it always in your mind to front up, you know, it was always going to be a Chris Barris band or...? Yeah, it's a weird one because um, I had a couple of friends that I was jamming with. Um, one was sort of my best friend, Ricky Mitchell, and he, he was a bass player. And he kind of really pushed me. He was like, oh, you should do this. Like, you know, you're good, you, you, should, you should do this. And, and he really helped me out at the start. And um, I was like, well, what are we going to call it? And he was like, it's Chris Barris Band. Like, it's you, man. Like, mm -hmm. And it, it was kind of his idea. And I was like, okay. And, you know, and I'd had a few, like, projects, even whilst I was fighting, like, some band projects, and never work out because it's so hard to get a band where everyone's got the same dedication, everyone's willing to make the same sacrifices. Yeah personally, financially, you know, yeah. it's really hard. So I thought, do you know what? I was in quite a, a comfortable position with, with the gym work I was doing and stuff like that. I was okay financially. I thought, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna be me. Mm. I'm gonna be responsible. I'm gonna pay for everything. Um, and, you know, if it works, it's cool. If it doesn't work, that's down to me. Mm. I, you know, I'm not gonna sit back and be like, oh yeah, well, the drummer didn't do this or the mm. so-and-so didn't do this. It's like, it's down to me. Um, I'm the only one that's responsible. I don't have to rely on anyone else because that's where I found like things went tits up before when you have to re rely on other people. So that's kind of why why I went down that route. And um, you know, I had like I said I you know I was quite fortunate that I was earning okay money doing what I was doing. And you know, I got friends that do like motocross. Mm -hmm. You know, and they do motocross and they'd, it would cost them like 10 grand a year to do it. All the repairs and, and or track feed or whatever else, you know, traveling. And I thought, well, I love playing my own music life. I don't mm -hmm. like playing covers in a bar. I hate that. I hate playing at weddings and that kind of crap. But the feeling, even if I was playing to 10 people, like singing my own song and like hearing people like enjoying my own music, that was worth it. And I thought, well, I love this. This mm -hmm. gives me something in my life. So I'm happy to invest however much money per year to get this thing going for a hobby because I love it. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and like I said, I've got friends that do motocross and they come out with a broken collarbone, 10 grand <laughs> down. Do you know what I mean? All, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I thought, well, I can do it and hopefully not break my collarbone on the road. Um, and that's my kind of approach, you know, whereas I, you know, I see like a lot of young bands and they're like, well, how much are we getting paid? It's like, dude, you can't even sell five tickets. You ain't getting paid nothing. Yeah. Like, come on. Like, it's, 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 it's a, you know, so I kind of treat it like a business. I yeah. treat it as if I was setting up a, sh a shop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I treat it like I'm setting up a shop. Well, I mean, I, my entire, you know, um, relationship with, with Chris is a five minute conversation, a sandwich queue at NAM, <laughs> and this interview basically, but already I can pick up, you've got um, a determined streak in you, you can you can hear from what you're talking about. You know when you did the fighting and the band, and and I know you know even silly things. I know, I know you owned a you owned a guitar shop, you know, at yeah. nineteen or something. It's like you, you know. Yeah. I think you've got you've got that uh, other essential ingredient that a musician, most musicians, are going to need if they're going to make it, which is like you're not just hoping that everything falls into place for you. No. You know, and I think you mentioned that ticket, the number of times when I talk to, you know, local um, music venues and they're just going, honestly, young, not just young bands, bands forever that just go, oh, yeah, we're, we're booked. So, you know, that that's we've, we've done the job. We've got the we've got the gig on the Friday night. You know, now it's up to the pub to, to promote it and see who turns up. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like if you don't set, if you don't get 100 people through the door paying five pound a ticket, whatever like that, do not expect a fee. It's like, yeah, it's not a charity. You yeah. know, it's like you have to treat and it's, this. It's as, tough. And, it, you know, yeah. it's not say there aren't, you know, unscrupulous promoters out there. And it's, you know, I, I've had some rough deals, where, you know, when I've been coming up. But yeah. um I've, I've built built the brand, built myself as an artist with the team I've got around me, the record label, management, etc. And um, you get to the stage where actually you can mm. say, well, no, I know I can sell mm. 500 tickets in this town. Therefore, I want to be paid this much otherwise. But otherwise I won't do the gig. And mm. I got to that stage and we did that. 
um, after getting some low offers, you know, and I said, well, I won't play unless I'm paid this much money and I know I can sell 500 tickets mm. and it all went through. We sold that, we ended up earning more money because we sold more, you know, and it works out, but you got to go through that in the early yeah. stages. And um, like I say, I, I never set out to be here doing this kind of stuff. This was not, this was not the plan. This was yeah. not, I never dreamed I'd be going out to LA to record an album with Billy Gibbons. Like that's, that was not the plan. <laughs> the plan was just to do a couple of small little festivals. You know, I, I start, when I started this band out, it was, it was a lot more bluesy. We were doing like the small blues festivals, you know, something playing to 80 people sat down, you know, and I loved that. Yeah. And that was what I wanted to do. Like that was my goal. I achieved yeah. my goal three years ago. Like yeah. what's happening now is just like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going with the flow. People say, oh, what's your next goal? It's like, I've achieved everything I want to achieve. I'm just going to keep rolling. Is that, that's really where you, I mean, let, we'll talk about some of the highlights that, you know, over the last, because it's, it's still, as you say, because of, of the time you took out of playing guitar, your, your, your journey is still a relatively short one, isn't it? In yep. terms of professionally. And you have played with some amazing acts and worked with some amazing people, which we'll, we'll come back to in a minute. But is, do you really feel... There must be, maybe they're not goals that you'll be necessarily disappointed if you don't achieve, yeah. but there must be things you go, oh man, if that would happen or that would happen, it would be a of dream. Of course, of course. I don't mean like, you know, I've given up and I'm mm. just like, oh, I don't, I don't mean like that. <laughs> but I just mean like anything that happens now is a bonus, yeah. like for me. And I, yeah, I've still got like things, you know. I mean, like this year I'm playing the Royal Albert Hall with Blackstone Cherry, doing Wembley Arena. Wicked. Doing London Palladium with Led Zeppelin uh, tribute thing. I'm coming on as a special guest and doing Hammersmith Apollo tomorrow night. You know, I mean, it's, I mean that's four like bucket list venues in one. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And, uh, you know, but I just, I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I've got a good team around me now that can kind of, they can set the goals and work the stuff and I'm just going to do I'm just going to keep plowing on, doing what I do, keep trying to improve. I'm constantly trying to improve as a vocalist, trying to improve as a player, improve as a songwriter. I'm just going to keep doing that, improve the live shows, and um, hopefully the business side will just take over itself. You know? Well, I hope so too. So come on, tell us about, you've, 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 you've done a few, I need, I need one of those horns that that pedal show I've got, so every time like a Billy Gibbons or someone, I can honk the horn, but <laughs> give us some of those like, you know, you've, where you've had to pinch yourself moments over the last five years. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Billy Gibbons thing is obviously quite <laughs> a big deal. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm signed to a record label, mascot label group, and you know they're pretty big uh, guitarists, bass label, mm -hmm. Joe Bonamassa, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and Eric Gales, and all these kind of people. And then Blackstone Cherry and whatever. But um, there's a band on the label called Supersonic Blues Machine, yes. which features Billy Gibbons and Steve Lukather, Warren Haynes, Walt Trout, <laughs> all these guys as like special guests, Gales as well. Um, and because it's like a core band that invites these guitarist guests on, I remember when I signed to Mascot, I remember I was sat in their office on like our first proper meeting. I said, all right, within three years, I want to be a special guest on one of their albums. That was a goal I set. I like, yeah. Three years, I want to be a special guest. Well, within nine months, I got asked to be the new front man. So, I mean, that was a crazy story. Like people would say like, you know, oh, how'd you get that gig, you know? And, because it is like crazy. It's an LA based band. I've just been doing the new album with them out in LA. Wow. Kenny Aaron off the drums, who's like played with everyone, you know. And um, I was actually put forward as their support act um, for the. Sh they did a Shepherd's Bush Empire yeah, show. Yeah, I think that yeah. was last year, wasn't it? I think, or... it, was, it was 2018. The year before. Yeah. Right. Because I, I, remem I remember July that. Fourth. I remember that uh, Supersonic, you know, uh, I, I just remember it being in the news that they were coming and uh, all these amazing guitar players so okay yeah. so that was your you were su supposed to be supporting yeah so um you know we had the same agent same record label so uh, you know it looked like it was you know that's how things work in the biz you know it's yeah. not not what you know it's who you know <laughs> and um yeah we got put forward but we didn't know that their fr front man lance lopez had actually left he was concentrating on his solo career he had some other stuff going on and um they were looking for a new guy and they actually saw some videos of me and was like, well, this guy's like pretty cool. And then I kind of got suggested by like some of the teams, like, well, what about Chris to be your front man? And it was a bit crazy because like, well, he's from the UK. Like, how's it all going to work? And we had some phone conversations um, with Fabrizio Grossi, who, who runs the band. He's right. the bass player and the producer and he put the whole project together with Billy. And um, yeah, I flew out, they flew me out to LA. We had a jam, had some wow. tequilas with Billy on yes. uh, Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. 
<laughs> and uh, what's the when we were we what's the Mexican place on Sunset? We were literally there, you know, for Nam, and everyone's going, "Oh, that's where you'll find Billy Gibbons." Yeah, like, all that's the where time. we went. Is I it? can't remember oh, what it's can't. called. It's virtually opposite Guitar Center, isn't it? Or just yeah. like about 100 yards down yeah, the street yeah. from them. Yeah, we should have gone it's in his there. We place. never did. He but... only lives up the road. We went to his house first. Oh. Um, next year, I'm hanging with you at next year's next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and we had some tequilas and that was it. Shook hands and that was, the deal was done. And uh, it's been great. It's been it's been. So what is that? A, is that an album band then? Or is it all about festivals and tours? And Yeah, I mean, tours are hard to put together because mm -hmm. everyone's so busy and... Um, Everyone's got stuff going on. Uh, so, I mean, we had, they've had two studio albums. I uh, did their live album last year. Um, that was recorded on a tour. Um, and then we've just done the third studio album, which will be out hopefully in the summer. Um, but yeah, it, it works really well as a festival band. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of like the, the best thing. And, you know, this year we had um, Eric Gales join us. He's that so was. Good. I mean, also I knew like how good he was and, yeah. and things like that, and um, but like we had this like bit where we had to do a guitar duel. I remember on the first night, and he just came at me with some stuff, and it was the only time ever I was like, I don't want to play back. <laughs> <laughs> I had this moment. I was like, oh shit! <laughs> you know, we're there like it's like fifteen thousand people. Girls just go <laughs> doing this crazy oh. thing. And I'm like, oh, and I think I didn't know what to do, so I just went. <laughs> I just did like, like I could wave the white flag, and uh, I said to him after, I was like, "Oh man, was like you just kicked my ass." He was like, "Oh no, no, you you put me on the back foot." He said I had to bring out the big guns. So the next night, um, he changed <laughs> it up again, and uh, but yeah, I, I, I luckily he started doing some stuff that is like kind of similar to what I do. I'm a bit of an old alternate picker, and he started doing some alternate picking. I thought, oh, I hung in there a bit better, and he came off. He's like, "Oh, you kicked my ass," and I was like. Oh. I think he let me win. He's, <laughs> like, he you know, like when you're like, off used to charts. play fight with your dad, and he'd like, yeah. let, let, I think it was like that. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, let Chris have have a little bit of fun. Like, he let I, me win. I I've seen so many videos of Eric Gales on stage with other guitar players, and it's just if he lets go, it's like everyone's toast. Like I, I, everyone's said, toast. I said to him, I was like, look, you can't really say who the best guitarist in the world is. Sure. I was like, but if you had to. I was like, I think it's you, you know. Yeah. Not yeah. There's stuff that he can't do and that, that people can do, mm. obviously. But for like how unique his sound mm. is and what he can bring to it, the passion, the energy, the technique, everything, um, the note choices. Mm. I uh, think we'd all. I think a big part of his locker is that the guitar's strung upside down. Yes. So every you know, even if he tried to play a lick like a right-handed player would play it. He will have his own flavour, and there's very few. I mean, you've got Doyle Bramall and stuff like that. He'll, he'll, you know, also play upside down. But he played as well. So yeah, another amazing guitar player. But Eric's got something. Because uh, was he does hybrid picking. He right. does a lot of hybrid picking. But obviously, when you're doing it the other way around, if I hybrid mm. pick, obviously my my plectrum's on the low strings, my fingers on the high strings. Yeah. But his the other way around, so he gets this real hard attack. So I, I, the first time I played him, I was like, oh, what compressor do you use? He's like, I don't use compression. I'm like, what? It was just from the amp, I think, because he mm -hmm. hits those strings. Like, it's got like a compressed twang. It was just from his, his DV Mark head. I it? love this. I love that you're called to come on for a Chris Barris interview and we just spend like <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> talking guitar, about yeah. how cool Eric Gale is. My publicist is. won't like but, it. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Look, so... Uh, um, so uh, anyone else, what, you know, in, in, I can imagine, who, who else has walked into either the studio or onto a stage where you've just literally just gone, I don't believe this. It's like where, I mean, have you, have you had Steve Luca though? You mentioned him as being in the yeah, band he, at some no, point. No, he hasn't done any of the shows right. that I've done uh, since he's been in the band. We haven't managed to get to line up. He had the Toto 40th anniversary stuff and then there was some right. contractual things with territories and stuff. Yeah. And, and he was doing the... Um, is it Ringo Starr? Ringo Starr's in Stars, he was doing that. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's a busy guy. He's trying to get it to work. and then Amazing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, playing with Billy is just amazing. Like, you know, I used to do Sharp Dressed Man in pubs. And now I play Sharp Dressed Man with a guy that wrote it, playing with it, like, stood next to me, you know. And he's such an inspirational guy. Like, he's 70 years old. And the passion he has for music 
It's just incredible, like uh, like as much as anyone I've ever met. Yeah. And he loves it. He's always like, oh, Chris, have you heard of this? And it'd be some really obscure 1950s like blues thing that I've obviously never heard of. And he would pass me his headphones and like, you know, he just loves it. Um, it's really cool to be around. I mean, you get him talking about gear. I mean, like, you know, he, he, you won't be able to stop him. Like he, he knows everything, he collects so much stuff. And um, so being around with him, like pretty cool. Uh, jam with Bernie Marston, that's oh, always a good, good thing, when he busts the beast out. Doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he's a great guy, he's become a friend of mine, and um, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. Yeah, it, it's lots of pinch me moments really with that band. And um, you do, Are you doing one of the blues cruises? Is that your thing, or have you done in the past? E you know, the, the Bonamassa When's this video thing? going out? Oh, okay. Well, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd seen... When's it get, it gets announced? 11th of Feb, so this will be after 11th of Feb. Yes, it will, yeah. I so, thought I'd seen you on a list already. But... We did the Bon Jovi cruise last year. Ah, maybe that's the one. But yes, we are doing the Joe Bonamassa cruise. Um, by the time this video goes out, hopefully it's been announced, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> it's definitely yeah, not going up before the 11th. Just, <laughs> well, yeah, we've, we've been added to that bill, so um, we're doing the European one. That's going to be good fun. And there's I lots of guys I know on there as well, like uh, Walt Trout and Johnny Lang. I toured with those guys uh, last year and we did like a whole... It's kind of like the blues G3. You, 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 you definitely, definitely <laughs> want to get Walter one night and just go tell me all the stories from... Oh, you know. I've had a lot. Do you know what? I, I, was, I was talking about this a couple of nights ago to someone. I said, like, you know, Motley Crue have got the dirt. Yeah. But like, I think Walter Trout should have a film because I reckon it would rival... <laughs> he should write... I mean, he's written a book, but I don't know how deep he's gone. Oh, man. Some of his stories... I'm staggered he can remember any of it. It's just like... Do you know what? His memory's amazing. He never forgets anyone's name. He's so good. Like... I, I, one of my friends came to a gig once yeah. and he met him at the start and at the end of the night he said, oh, see you later, Ricky. Mm. Like, he remembered it. He's I think, so on it. I think, actually, in the sandwich queue of stars that was at the NAMM show, I think literally either two minutes before I'd seen you or two minutes afterwards, uh, Walt was sitting having his sandwich and ran over and said, like, hey, man. Like, oh, he was there, was he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Literally, I, I think, in the brilliant. same sandwich queue as right. we saw each other. He's great. He, he is cool. He's another one that's <laughs> he just... He is cool. Uh, well, Jamming look, with him's fun. Let, we could talk about this for days, but it is a gear channel and we should talk about some gear. Yeah. So you've bought uh, a guitar, which I'm not familiar with, uh, but a very pretty looking guitar. And yeah. I've heard of the builder, but some of the guys watching may not have. So tell us about your, your Bacchus guitar. Yeah, so this is a Bacchus Nautilus. Um, it was custom made for me. I chose all the bits and bobs. I chose everything on it. Um, it's made by a guy uh, based in Cornwall called Seth Bacchus. Um, he's related to Andy Manson of Manson Guitars fame. And um, yeah, he's incredible. It's a one man operation, he builds everything. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, got, I got introduced to Seth through, um, oh, we knew of each other for years because obviously he was in the area, but I got introduced through a friend of mine, uh, Jason Morris, and um, he's a great guitar player. And, um, he said, oh, you know, you should check out the guitars, like, you know, and I did. And, uh, yeah, he's built me a couple now. I've got this one. I've got a uh, baritone that he's built too. And, um, yeah, it's amazing. It's a uh, Swamp Ash body, um, super light. We've got a uh, maple top, um, and it's a chambered body as well. Mm. So it's uh, hollow in there. Um, I've got mahogany neck. Streaky Ebony, which is my favourite. Streaky for, Ebony. I don't know if that's official name, that's what I call it. <laughs> it's every Ebony uh, fingerboard with stripes, that's what I like. Um, bare knuckle pickups. It's environmentally friendly Ebony, because yes. apparently, this is an amazing story, I think, only about 10% of Ebony trees that are cut down are actually black in the middle. So for years and years and years, when violin makers and Gibson and all that said, you know, guitar makers said, I only want the black Ebony, like 90% of Ebony trees were just left to rot right. when they were cut down. And now people are much more conscious, uh, environmentally conscious about not cutting trees down. And so that's just what yeah. ebony looks like when it isn't completely black. And the whole black. rosewood being protected. Yeah, thing, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, awkward. sorry, so you, yeah. you, were you were you a Les Paul guy before? You know, no. you've always been like a single cut double humbucker. What's your no, guitar not at journey? No, really. Um, I've always been more of like a, a Fender guy. Okay. I've got a 1984 Strat that I love. I've got a custom shop telly. Uh, that I love. Um, yeah, this is quite. I mean, a lot of people like to s just because of the single cut and the I was like, oh, Les Paul. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like a Les Paul, you know. Um, it's much lighter, I like Gibson's, isn't it? I, you know, I, I 
I play a uh, 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 three five five, and um, you know I do, I do like Gibson stuff. I've never really got on with Les Pauls. I've played a couple that have been like, oh, it's really nice, but they always tend to be ones that are like fifty Martin's grand or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, but um, yeah, this this sits in its own like little place, you know. But it's like such a boutique instrument. Um, it, yeah, it kind of it sits reminds in its own place. me of a Nick Huber, um, like yeah. a Kraut, Kraus, Krauster, Krauster. Yeah, um, that and or is it the Nags? Do they make them? Yeah, I don't. I'm like not. That. I'm really not very familiar with Nags. No, but you, Joe Nags is the is the old um, master builder, isn't he from PRS days? If I remember rightly, everyone watching this now is going, "No, he isn't." But yeah, I don't uh, yeah, he's another guy. Just very, very yeah. you know, small numbers of it's guitars, very, very high end. Um, I've got it coil tapped. Both of these are coil tapped. What are the pickups in them? So they're bare knuckle. Uh, uh, another that's... Cornwall boy. Yeah, You're keeping it all in the keeping old it, west. Keeping you know. it local, boy. <laughs> Single-handedly <laughs> keeping the guitar economy of Cornwall going. Good for you. So uh, that's a riff raff, which is like a, supposed to be like a seventies classic rock kind of sound, yep. I think. And that's a Stormy Monday. Ah, oh, it's a good pickup. Um, yeah, it's wicked, and it's coil tapped here, um, which that gets a lot of use. I mean, I know on my my latest album, Light It Up, available from all good record stores, <laughs> um, and very good it is too. I've been listening to <laughs> quite a lot of that this last two or three days. Um, do you know what, this actually gave me like a, a more stratty sound than my Strat. So I found like, when I, when I wanted like a stratty tone on the album, it was this that oh, I, was, right. I was using more than my Strat. Um, Give us a little noodle, because I'm, I'm, I don't tend to find... You're all going to listen to it and I go, that doesn't sound well, like Strat, Well, I don't mate. tend to find it's split humbuckers ever really sound stratty. <laughs> Sound, it's got hasn't twang. it? Yeah, I agree. And if you just go back to full humbucker, does it go crazy? What scale length? Is it? it sounds like a longer scale length than a Les Paul. Sounds yeah. like. <laughs> if that's oh, even do you know possible. What? I don't know. Not sure. So, okay, fair enough. We'll find I out. I didn't get that <laughs> technical with it. <laughs> Seth, Seth I came around my house and he, he brought about six, seven different guitars. I tried a bunch of them and I said, well, I like that of that. Yeah. I like that of that, that of that. And I want this. And we just did like. So I don't really get caught up in like, all that stuff. Like, I always get asked questions like that. And, like, you know, I don't know. I just if it sounds like good and like you like and, it, then yeah, that's fine. I don't get so too caught up in it. Uh, we plugged you in uh, for this little video with a conventional, you know, kind of valve amplifier and some pedals on the floor, and I think you sound ace. But you are a dark side player. Yes, um, controversial. Controversial. I'm not entirely sure that that's allowed on this show. Um, <laughs> but so no, I've seen your us. video. I've seen your test video. It was I one know. of the things that helped convince me actually was your <laughs> test video where. If you haven't seen it, he fails miserably. I do. And cannot identify it's, it's what, a, which sound is which. It's a low point in my, uh, <laughs> in my life. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I have this, as, as you say, I have this bizarre love-hate relationship with Kemper in that I don't want to accept that it's possible to sound that good and not have glowing bits of glass. Um, yep. So somehow I treat, keep trying to convince myself that it's, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't really exist. But it obviously does. So tell us about, you know, what, what was the tipping point? At what point did you just go, I can't be bothered to lug this 4x12 or whatever you were using <clears throat> I still before. use cabs, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I was the same as you. <clears throat> I didn't want to believe. Um, Sounds like a religious yeah, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want to follow the cult. Um, uh, my producer, who's also the... Uh, organ player, keyboard player in the band, uh, Josiah Manning. He had some cameras in the studio and absolutely loved them. It's like, and he's like a real tone freak, mm. um, more so than me, really. And uh, he said, "You have to try one. Like you have to." And I was like, "No, won't like it. Won't like it." 
I like what I like, you know. It's not class A, it's rubbish. And um, he got and tripped me one night. I was in the studio and we were doing some bits of bobs and one of his friends who has a Kemper just happened to pass by and bring <laughs> it in. And So they plugged it in and they were like, oh, just try it. And I was like, you know, I was like a kid, like being made to eat broccoli. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was like, there's no way I was going to like it. And then he put it on and he hit a couple of chords and I was like, that's weird. And I was like, give it here. And I took the guitar off and I was like, what? This doesn't make sense. And then I started doubting myself. I was like, there must be something like wrong with me. I must just like <laughs> not know like what sounds good anymore. Like uh, uh, there must be something wrong with me. And they let me borrow it for um, like a few weeks and I sat with it every day and I was tinkering and um, he had really good profiles on there, all the Michael Britt profiles, which are in my yep. opinion, by far the best. Most people's opinion are by far the best in the, in the world for Kemper. And um, I just didn't want to believe it. It was just so weird. I was like, but it sounds so cool. There's a lot of misconceptions about the Kemper and I think a lot of it lies in the fact either the person that's testing it probably isn't a very good player or you know doesn't know what they're talking about. Or they've not used it on the right profiles. Mm -hmm. um, which is probably the most common one. I think you just fire it up and you just, oh, it doesn't sound right. Mm. You've got to spend some time with it. You've got to learn how to use it. There, there, there's so many tweaks and so many things you can do. And it's also to remember like the main use for it. You know, the fact that it really comes to life on a live big stage where you're relying on your guitar sound going through the PA. Right. You know, um, that's, that's the main, you know, proper touring artists that, need a consistent good sound. I mean, I've done countless of gigs, countless gigs where festivals, whatever, I, you know, and I use in-ear monitors. So if anything changes with guitar sound, it's like the most drastic thing ever. And, you know, an SM57 points straight at the cone of a cranked uh, valve amp is, is not a polite sound in your ears. <laughs> like, don't direct your ear, because no yeah. one's used to hearing it like that, you yeah. know, straight from the amp, straight to your ear like that. This is a horrible sound. I um, mean, I really struggled when I started going to ears. I did that for vocal reasons. Mm. You know, doing 150 dates a year, you got to try and look after your voice and, you know, struggling to hear something more. But like countless times I'd be playing and I'd, I'd be like, where's my guitar gone? And I'd turn around and, you know, the mic's falling over, <laughs> you know, it's like stuff like that. And it's always inconsistent, never the same tone in your ear. Mm. Um, and when I started using the camera, oh, it's just perfect. But it sounds beautiful in my ears every time. I know I've got exactly the same tone yep. going to the front house. You know, obviously we do quite big places now. Um, the amp, uh, the, the stage volume, doesn't really matter the size mm. places we play now. You don't really hear, you know, what's off. You just it's hear you're hearing from yeah. the PA, mm. you know. Um, so the, the mic'd up sound's really important. And the way that, you know, especially Michael Britt's profiles are made, they're, they're just done in like the best possible environment, how they're profiled, the best possible mics, mic placement and all this stuff. And, um, are you still yeah. using pedal? What, what, so what are the, typically, what are the profiles that you're using? Not the specific ones, but what yeah, amps so, do you typically yeah, go um, for? 69 Marshall gets right. a good run out. Um, I like using some uh, 58 Fender Deluxe. Um, Dumble, use a Dumble. Profile, um, third power. I've yeah. never heard it before. Is it like, like some Californian boutique brand uh, or something? Didn't they do the triangular shaped cabs or something? I'm looking right. for a thumbs up from the control room. They are getting one. Know. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, but there's another boutique. But they're cool. Like, yeah. Yeah, they've got a really good profile. That mm. that's my main lead tone actually. Mm. Well, that and a, a Dumbo I use um, with o Overdrive Special with uh, for my lower gain solo stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, those are my main. Main ones, really. And if you're in the studio, are you just like, yeah, just wheel out the Kemper, or do you sort of go, oh, maybe I will so just blow some dust album, off some amps? Yeah, I mean, I still love amps, like mm. I, I do, and um, sometimes part of me misses them. And you know, there's definitely something to be said for the limitations of an amplifier when you're in the studio. Um, you know, you've got to get the tone there and then. Sometimes with a Kemper, you can kind of get a little bit lost. You know, you scroll for, well, that sounds the best. And then, you know, oh, no, no, no I think that one. Oh, no. You know, you've got so many options. Yeah. You can kind of get a bit yeah. like, you know, whereas with an amp, you're like, well, mm. I know this Fender amp sounds like this. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's the tone. Yeah. Off we go. So I still like that about the studio. Um, on my last album, um, we had tons of different amps. We had Morgans, Vox, Marshalls. Um, 
my uh, Laney Lionheart, and um, you know, sometimes the amps work best, but then we also, we were treating the Kemper as an amp head, so mm -hmm. turning off the cab sims, and so it got treated exactly the same as any of the heads. Yeah. So it would go into the cab and it would be mic'd up on the cab, room mics, and so treated exactly the same as the head. Do you know what? A lot of time it came out on top. Like it did. Like, you know, I had the options there. I had great amps and yep. um, a lot of time I'd think, oh, no, this is going to be one for like a Marshall. And then I'd get a profile up and I'd be like, oh, God, that sounds really good. Oh, let's use that. I think Michael does an amazing job of, of profiling. Yeah, he does. He picks, he gets great examples of great amps. He uses great mics, great channel strips. So, you know, it's just like when you hear it, you just, you do go tough to... Tough yeah. to really go. Oh, I don't, you know, there's. A, I don't want to use these. It's not these. for everyone. It's not. Mm. It doesn't. I, you know, it doesn't suit everyone. Mm. I, I love it for home use actually. For mm. when I've got to do like songwriting demos or practice, because you've got a wicked sound at low volume, mm. and that's something that we always struggled with with amps. I've got Cornford Harlequin. Remember them? Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. Six watt things. I, I, I used to rely on that a lot because you get a nice tone at lower volumes. Now, like with the camper, like practicing at home, at lower volumes. You know, terraced house and. Uh, and um, you, do you just do you have a couple of pedals that you chuck in the front of the Kemper, or do you I've tend to? I just started experimenting with that actually, and it's working pretty well. Mainly because a lot of new stuff I'm working on has got some crazy fuzzy effects, and um, you can't really get it out of the Kemper on its own. So um, yeah, I've just started experimenting with that, and it actually works really, really well. So I'm I'm thinking maybe towards the year I might actually build a simple pedal board, mm. and then work some way to integrate it all. And well. Yeah, it, it works surprisingly well. But like for me, like someone, you know, I fly to a lot of shows. Yeah. You know, and I, I take it onto the plane. It goes in the overhead locker. I turn up. You know, I mean, I, when we had to rely on backline, you know, I'm doing shows in uh, Lithuania, Poland, where you do not know what you're going to get. You can spec, and they yeah. will tell you they've got yeah. stuff that's suitable. And you'll turn up, and you'll be like, "What is this?" You know. Sometimes I get right. Sometimes I won't. You know? Yeah. Um, was I know, or I can just put down four by twelve cab. Marshall or similar, you know, you can't get that wrong. Yeah, it's the same with Billy when he tours JCM 800. He knows he can get, yep. hit, he get a tone out of that. It's not what he uses when he tours with Easy Top, but he will spec JCM 800 4x12 cab. He knows he can go up to it, bush bosh bang, SG goes in, he's got his tone, you know, it's like straight away. It's like that with me, but I don't like JCM 800. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, do you know what? Actually, another story. Go right? on. Whilst I'm dropping names. Um, I was actually a little bit worried. I just, but the first tour I ever used the Kemper on was the Supersonic Blue Machine tour because I wanted an amp that I what could... What would Billy say? Exactly. Exactly. So the the first kind of rehearsal session, there's three guitarists. There's another guy who does the rhythm stuff, Serge Simich. I do most of the lead stuff and obviously Billy does the Billy stuff. And um, we had a bit of a session where it was like, right, let's get our tones working together. And Billy's like super keen on that. Obviously, Billy's got his tone, that's mm -hmm. what he sounds like, like, you know, so that's set, obviously. Um, he came over to Serge's and a little tweaks, so, like, yep, that sounds cool. And then he came to mine and I was like cringing. I thought he's just gonna look at this and be like, what is this? And he I came over and he just said, I was like, have you seen one of them before? He's like, oh yeah, I've used them in the studio. He goes, I can't use it. He said, my engineer does it for me. He's like, but yeah, because they're great. I was like, okay. You know, there's a guy that's got like over 200 uh. guitars, Christ knows how many amps, you know, he's like, he's a proper collector. And like, and I played my tone and um, John, it was through a different cab. It was through like a, a vin Marshall, like vintage cab. It was the previous day, it was just through like a normal like 1960 cab or whatever. And it sounded a lot brighter, but I hadn't had a chance to do any mm -hmm. tweaks yet. Because I run two different EQs, because you can split on the Kemper so that you have an EQ for the cab. Yeah. And then I have, um, obviously, the set EQ that goes out to the PA. So um, I hadn't had a chance to change it. And it was a little bit a little bit harsh. And Billy just goes, oh, yeah, so it's a little bit bright. I was literally just took some of the presents off and he's like, perfect. And that was it. You know, and, and that was it. And it, he's made a few coins, but yeah, you get a good sound out of that thing. Well, there know? we are. So. What can I say? Eventually, the dark side will get us all because the power is too strong. <laughs> it's, not, it's not for everyone, you know. If you can get your tone, plug it. I mean, I, I used to play direct into an amp with no pedals, like you know, and I'd do it all on my volume. Yeah. And it's know. good training, that I think. Yeah, it's you cool. Know. It's, uh, but uh, like, for me, I'm not saying I'll use Kemper forever either. I might change my mind, you know. I, I might get to two years down the line and just decide I want to go a bit more simple, and I'll just 
I'll get a two rock and off I go, you know, but who knows? Who but, knows? Yeah. Well, look, I think it's been a pleasure you coming in. Thanks you are, we are bizarrely off to the same place now as uh, I'm, we're, we're going up to, to try and catch a, a quick interview with uh, Satchel from Steel Panther and you're going up to see the show. So we may well see you a bit later yeah. on in Brixton. But look, for now, Thank you very much. Everybody, this is Chris Barris. I will put links in the description below. You should go and check out his music, listen to his radio show on Planet Rock. Go see him on tour, whatever. But it's been a pleasure having you on. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. And thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you next time.